That is a name for a while. Uh, yes, it was in Illinois. It was oh, almost yeah. the name of the group. 301 West. Uh, this is our, our practice house where Eric Swenson and his father lived, and it was our clubhouse. We used to do. Uh, we used to spend a lot of time here, like 24 hours a day. I, you know, I lived here in a way, sort of. Actually, I did live here in that bedroom for a while. I, I paid rent. typing and it's evening and he's very engrossed in what he's typing and his window is halfway open with a window on the wall and while he's typing a pod creature floats through it doesn't make the noise it makes is a chirping noise, but it's below the noise of the typewriter in Swafford. Anyway, Swafford's typing along, and it's like a, it's, it's almost like a jellyfish floating, you know, but sort of a pod creature that pulses as it moves, you know, sort of. And while he's typing, it floats towards Mr. Swafford's head, and then suddenly it clamps down on his head but he seems to from his expression he doesn't he's totally oblivious to us and typing away and there's but there's almost a, a funny smile on his face as if he knows it's happening it shoots its tendrils down into his brain and it starts pulsing it's a parasitic thing it sort of pulses like uh well, Eric described it like giant tes testicles, sort of like inflating and deflating. It's, it's, Swafford seems to have this almost, almost blind indifference. I mean, you would think that someone would notice that, you know, and it's, it, the, the more it works, it's like the more he's deliberately ignoring it, you know, and he's typing along. And, uh, finally, after it's done all it can to drain his brains out, it collapses on his head and he's typing away and it's almost like on cue, Swafford, there's a mirror right by 
right? Swafford's sort of vain and likes to look at himself now. <laughs> and Swafford just makes a slight glance over and sees the pod, this pod creature on his head and, you know, very stylish. Can I get you to introduce yourself and tell me oh, a little yeah. bit about how you got involved with the Pinchwood Well, game? we all started there at, uh, what was oh, that? Yeah. High Street. Club. High Street. Yeah, yeah. High Street. Mark, Mark and I and Steve, we uh, all met at, what was that? The Den, well, Tiger's the Den. The Tiger's yeah, Den. The Tiger's Den. And we went over practice it's one night. It's a little park now. And then James <laughs> we'll came along. It's just right here. Eric. The swath. <laughs> George. <laughs> the swoop. Yeah. And, uh, Do you remember any Swafford stories? <laughs> oh, yeah. There was tell us one. Yeah, there was plenty of head banging when he didn't like his drama. <laughs> he says, uh, like, Daddy Swaff come in one time, and I think we were taking a break because Big Daddy Swaff came in with a McDonald's bag, you know? And he came in. Hey, hey, here's your lunch. Like that, and everybody just. <laughs> What's in it for me? Yeah. <laughs> there was but, your lunch. <laughs> yeah, right. So Eric had to go bang. These are great. <laughs> and ate his lunch, you know. Can anybody do the authentic Swafford's uh, vocal though? Uh, Somebody must know it. Let's see, I was in a band. I, I hung out with the guys who were in a band called uh, The Varmints. I think they, I can't remember, they either, they either were The Fugitives and then they were The Varmints. And it was Scott Stephen and um, Dave Dilley and Gerard was. Gerard Farrell was part of it at one point or another, um, and I was kind of there. I it was they practiced in Scott's basement, and I just kind of hung out. So I was, you know, I was I loved music and and was looking for an opportunity to do a little more than that. And I got invited to join a band with by a guy named Ron Carlstrom, who is a champagne kid, and and we that band never got out of the basement. We, and he he came up with actually came up with the name Seeds of Doubt. And then one night it was the um, the Fugitives were playing, opening for uh, the Gentries, who had a hit, Do You Want to Dance, playing at Lincoln Square, uh, you know, in the Lincoln Square Pavilion. And uh, Stevie Meyer, who was a drummer, of, there was a band called The Mystics, who were, well, I, I thought the best band in, in Champaign-Urbana then. They did a lot of, they were the first band to do Gloria, and, the, and when, when them did it, before, long before the Shadow of, Shadows of Night did it. And anyway, so Stevie Meyer came up to me at this thing and asked me if I wanted to be part of the Mystics, and it was like, it was like a god coming to me asking me if I wanted to be, you know, go to Nirvana, and uh, so I was floored. So yeah, so I so that's how I joined, and and then we I stole the name from Ron Carlstrom, and I hope he's forgiven me by now. So we came up with so we became the Seeds of Doubt, and and started working with. Uh, Bob Nutt and and Bob kind of, I think must have come to one of our, I think our one of our he came to some gig and he said you know we can do a lot more with this so he became our manager and I think and I don't know whether he it was whether it, it, I think I'm not sure who was first whether it was us or the Finchley Boys but we the Finchley Boys and us were the first two of the of his bands. How did the Finchley Boys get started? Uh, it was summer of '66. I was 15 or 16. Mm -hmm. I was 16. Mark was. You were like 15 at the time, and um, Eric Swenson's house was the kind of clubhouse where we used to hang out and sniff glue and uh, skip school and uh, look at girly magazines and smoke cigarettes or whatever else we could get to smoke. But I came by one day and there was this kind of clean cut kid there with black hair and a shiny red electric guitar. Uh, Eric had gotten a set of drums earlier in the year and they were doing Beatles songs or Rolling Stones songs. Animal songs, um, and I, basically uh, they were playing. And I just sort of hogged in and started singing. I had a lot of experience uh, in front of the mirror in my parents' house doing Mick Jagger imitations to uh, Rolling Stones records. So I was up for the job. And what the deal was like with the Shirley Girls is they would go to see a concert or something like that um, back in the early days. Uh, for instance, the Yardbirds, which they became good friends with the Yardbirds. But they would all pack in a car, which um, Mr. Shirley, Roy Shirley, the father, 
would drive the three girls and a couple of us guys up to Chicago, for instance, and he'd wait in the car while we'd hear the concert. He'd drive us in over to whatever hotel they were staying at and wait in the car while we went up, you know, because we were kids at this point in time. And he, you know, he was just a very, you know, he was a farm guy, a dairy farmer, and a real quiet guy. And he'd just wait in the car and <laughs> around 1.30 or 2 o'clock in the morning, we'd come back out and then drive back down to Champagne and stuff. But then later on, when we were old enough to drive ourselves and stuff, uh, when the yard, I mean, when the, uh, when Zeppelin finally formed with uh, Jimmy Page's first band, and, and you know, and like Jimmy Page would call up and say, call Mary, for instance, and say, "We're going to be in Chicago. Come, come down and check it out." So we're in a hotel room with Jimmy Page, and he was like genuinely glad to see us and stuff. And like I said, there was no sex going on with the Shirley Girls and 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 the and the Yardbirds are with Jimmy Page and stuff at this point, but. He dug the fact that they were such avid fans. There were three pretty girls at the time, and uh, really, uh, Mary was, you know, a schooled musician. She majored in music and had perfect pitch and all that kind of stuff. Played violin and and enough guitar to be able to transpose things, uh, that sort of thing. And Jimmy was working on a piece of music. I, I think it was Tchaikovsky. And I, oh, Chopin was what I thought. Chopin, maybe. I, I'm not sure, but he was looking through it and. Um, he uh, he asked Mary to kind of you know show him how it went, and uh, she picked up the guitar and it was the intro to Stairway to Heaven. You know, I think my girlfriend had cheated on me and was off dating some guy in Bloomington or something, and um, and I just I drank a lot of champagne and took off all my clothes and uh, you know started screaming at everybody and had to be kind of. Uh, you were eased out of them to take their clothes off. Yes, I was. Yes, I was. You were challenging. Them. I was challenging them. You know, and it was. I mean, it was always. It was always this interesting sort of dynamic between the sort of local kids, and you know, and the, the, a lot of the first jobs we played, especially. Be, I think when we were the Mystics before we had become the Seeds of Doubt, sort of in that little, when I think it was Dan Daly was the guy's name was was nuts fraternity brother. We played a lot of fraternity houses, and 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 we would we often would have to sort of almost fight our way out of there because some of the lo our, some of our local friends would come and there was always this sort of tension like they kind of they kind of thought of us as kind of like these cute kids or something and we didn't really like that very much but i had a dream uh, about performing with uh, a black indigo snake I, I didn't know it was called black indigo snake but it, it was a black iridescent snake and uh the, and I dreamed also that Tabe, the bass player, had a falcon sitting on his shoulder. And, um, you know, like a falconer would have with the little helmet on it, uh, you know. And then at some point he'd pull the helmet off and while he was playing bass and release it. And it would swoop over the audience and swoop down and the crowd would go would freak out. And then, and then it would come back and land on his shoulder again and he'd keep on playing. And then I'd pull out the snake and dance around like I did. Well... I told Tabe about the dream, and I thought that's where it would end, you know. I just, God, I had this weird dream, you know. And next day, he had purchased a falcon and a snake. No kidding. <laughs> and, but we couldn't train the falcon. I mean, and, and then we talked to a couple of experts, and they said, oh, God, you can't do that. <laughs> it might pull somebody's eyeballs out, you know. But um, we just... Did the Falcon ever make it to a rehearsal or anything? No, we uh, we messed with it outdoors a bunch, you know, but um, we ended up giving the Falcon back to the pet store and getting our money back, you know, but but the snake we kept. And, um, yeah, it we, we did that for, you know, a lot of gigs. But we started showing up at gigs in Chicago, and though it would be like live boa constrictor with the Finchley boys in small print, you know, so we kind of got pissed off that the snake was getting top billing and, and kind of cooled out after a while. Yeah.